Greetings from NAFSA 2017. This is Up Close with Isabel Wilkerson, an award-winning journalist and author and our opening plenary speaker at this year's conference. Ms. Wilkerson spent 15 years writing The Warmth of Other Suns, which explores the great migration of over 6 million African Americans in the United States during the 20th century. The Warmth of Other Suns received numerous awards, including the National Book Critics Circle Award for nonfiction. For her journalism, Ms. Wilkerson earned the Pulitzer Prize and the 2015 National Humanities Medal. Ms. Wilkerson has lectured on the narrative nonfiction at the Neiman Foundation at Harvard University and has taught as a professor of journalism at Princeton, Emory, Northwestern, and Boston University. She also frequently writes op-ed pieces for the New York Times on issues of social justice and racial equality. It's a pleasure to speak with you this afternoon. Oh, great to be here. What inspired you to write The Warmth of Other Suns? Well, I decided to plunge into this topic because I am a product of this great migration, and uh, as are the majority of African Americans in the North, Midwest, and West. And uh, because I grew up around it, um, but no one was really talking about it, it kind of fueled my desire to understand what were the forces that created this massive movement. I didn't know that it was going to end up taking 15 years. I didn't know uh, how long it was going to take. So I didn't set out to spend 15 years on it to begin with. But it turned out that this movement was so massive that it took a tremendous amount of time to look into it. And I ended up interviewing over 1,200 people to narrow it down to the three people who make up the core of the book. How did those three people stand out to you? Well, you know, when I began the, the, the search for uh, these people, I knew I wanted one person to represent each of the three migration streams. So when this great migration began uh, during World War I, um, people uh, poured out of the South along three beautifully predictable streams. So I knew I wanted one person for each stream. So there was the, the East Coast stream, you know, up the East Coast from Florida, Georgia, the Carolinas, and, and uh, Virginia up to Washington, D.C., and all up to New York. Uh, there was the Midwest stream, which carried people from, you know, Alabama and, and Tennessee, Arkansas, Mississippi, up to Chicago and the Midwest. And then there was the West Coast stream, which carried people from Louisiana and Texas out to California. So I needed to have one to represent each of those streams. And then I also was looking for people who had had um, different precipitating events that propelled their migration. So you would get a different, a sense of how broad and how many different ways and aspects of consideration people had to make before um, deciding to leave. And then I also wanted to have a range of people in certain backgrounds so that, you know, there's someone who's a sharecropper's wife and there's someone who has, has a bit of college, he's working, but he's working in the orange groves, and then one of them, a Florida, and then one of them is actually a surgeon in the Army who's based in, who ultimately was from Louisiana and made the journey out to California. So I was looking for a range of experiences that together would give any reader a sense of what it was like to be a part of this great movement. Mm. Well, certainly because of your book, more people are aware of the Great Migration as a historical phenomenon here in the United States, but can you talk some more about some of the conditions that caused people to leave the South in the first place? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, you know, well, the in order to even begin to grasp it, you have to almost suspend what you think we think we know about um, our, uh, you know, life in not that long ago in our hist country's history. And that world was so different from the world that we're in in some ways, although we live with the after effects of it still. But that was a world in which people were really living in a caste system in which um, everything that a person could or could not do was based upon what they looked like. Um, it was actually against the law for a black person and a white person to play checkers in Birmingham, meaning it was against the law for you to play checkers with a person of a different race. Uh, there were separate everything. We, we often think of, of the Jim Crow era as separate water fountains and separate restrooms, but that was just, that, that was just the very beginning. I mean, it went to actually every aspect of human interaction. There actually were separate telephone booths in, in, in Oklahoma. I mean, every single thing that you could imagine was, was, uh, was separate. And the, the overarching 
um, structure of this was that it was it was actually necessary to keep the people separate according to the way the caste system was set up in order to maintain the economic structure that was underneath it. And in order to maintain it, there was a tremendous amount of violence in order to enforce and police these behaviors. So it was a, it was a nerve-jangling, dangerous, and, and often violent existence, for, really for everyone involved, because it meant everyone had to adhere to the boundaries that were set by this caste system. Hmm. That's interesting that you would mention Birmingham, since my mother was actually born and raised in, in Bessemer. Oh my um, goodness, and the steel. Yes, yeah, yeah she, um, she spoke regularly about seeing the Klan riding through their neighborhood and the intimidation from the Klan and just from, from other white people who um, would often yell racial epithets or, or, or mistreat um, blacks in the city. And um, when she described her journey to the West Coast, she said that she got in her car and she didn't stop until she hit the Pacific Ocean. And that stuck with me for years, you know, that, that idea, that metaphor, that something so traumatic could cause someone to get in the car and, and not stop until they reach the edge of a continent. Um, so I think that it's, it's really important that you um, draw out those, those reasons because they're, they're, they're real. I mean, what you described that, that your, mother, your mother's um, propulsion out of the South is so similar to and parallel to what we're seeing throughout the world today. Mm -hmm. I mean, what migrants do with people who leave all that they know for a place that they've never seen in hopes that, that life might be better is a, is a deeply human impulse that, that really um, you know, draws all of us together. That's it's an example of how similar we are. That we're so much more alike than we are different. It's that same impulse that that um, in, you know that propelled the Pilgrims to cross the Atlantic. That propels people from you know from South and Central America to cross the Rio Grande. That pro that propels people from to cross the Pacific Ocean to get here. And also is propelling all the the shifting. Um, populations that we're seeing in, in Europe and middle, the Middle East. I mean, all of these things are interconnected. And one of the, the goals of what I'm doing, the goals of this book and the goals of, of, of this effort to understand and to recognize our common humanity is to show that we all have similar impulses for freedom and for agency and for the ability to be who we are supposed to be. And when we are prevented from being able to do that in a place that we are born, it takes a tremendous amount of courage to leave all of that and to set out for some place far away. And the determination of your mother, it just so inspires me. You know, I have heard literally thousands of stories about the Great Migration, thousands of stories about migration of all kinds. People, after I t give a talk or speak about this book, people will say to me, you know, I had a great-grandmother who, you know, came from Ireland and migrated to Cleveland. Her mother put her on the boat when she was eight years old when she was to meet an, an uncle. So I hear this all the time, but I never tire of hearing these stories. I get inspired every time I hear it, mm -hmm. because each story, such as the one of your mother is an example of, of, of someone trying to break free. Mm -hmm. And it will continue as long as people need to, bre to break free. Absolutely. Do you have um, a migration story from your own family that you'd like to share with us? Well, as I had indicated earlier, um, you know, I am a, a product, as are the majority of African Americans in the North, Midwest, and West, of this this great movement. And like many, uh, it's very it's it's a deeply uh, American experience too, when you think about it, because the vast majority of Americans, um, you know, descended from lineages that might not have existed had there not been migration. I mean, so many people, so many Americans are, are you say, descended from a great-grandmother from Russia who married a great-grandfather from, from Germany or from, uh, from Ireland or from uh, Italy, wherever they might be, and create whole new lineages. And so that's the same for me and for most African Americans, although it's not recognized as that in our country. Mm -hmm. It's not recognized as uh, essentially an immigration within the borders of our own country. So I, too, am a product of that. My, uh, my mother migrated from Georgia to Washington, D.C. Um, as, a, as a young woman right out of college, she set forth not 
knowing what the future was going to hold. She ended up going to Washington, D.C., and th it's there that she, she met my father, who had been a Tuskegee Airman, but he was from Virginia originally. Mm -hmm. And so what one of the beauties of, of migration is that people who would never, ever have met um, come together and create whole new lineages, which is essentially the, the story of America. So I, as I mentioned, I'm from California. Both of my parents, my father came to California from Greenville, South Carolina, oh. and they, they met here in Los Angeles. Yes. And um, I grew up here, but I went to graduate school in Durham, North Carolina. And when I went to graduate school, my, my parents said, we left the South so that you would never have to return. Um, and now you're going back. And they were fearful of what, what I might experience there. But a lot of African Americans seem to be returning to the South after years of, of migration. Do you, why do you think that is? Well, you know, my, my answer is always <laughs> going back to uh, what human beings do. And in our country, you know, African Americans are Americans. And I just was, you know, there are some studies that have just come out about the demographics of the country, that, that have, the demographics that have changed in the last 10 years or so. And it turns out that Americans overall are, you know, are uh, turning, they're moving to the south and west, meaning they're moving southward and westward. They're also moving from the bigger congested cities to maybe some, sometimes to smaller mid-range cities. They're moving. There's all kinds of movement going on, as always. It's what human beings do. And I often will, you know, my first reaction is to say, if those general trends are going on for Americans overall, African Americans are American, and they're doing what other Americans do. So that's one thing, to separate out African Americans and saying they're doing something different from other Americans. Um, I, I push back from that a little bit. Mm -hmm. But I do say, I do recognize that there is also a karmic and ancestral connection that is significant and, and definitely important to note. It's also very common, too, to hear what your parents said. I, I, um, that as well, that happened to me as well when I had to, to go into certain parts of the South and my, to work on this book, and my parents were very concerned and worried because being from a different generation, they remembered things as they had been. But to, to circle back to your question, um, the, because of the Great Migration, which was in some ways the advance guard of the Civil Rights Movement, because so many people fled and in fleeing they formed, they essentially created kind of a referendum on what was going on in the South. Mm -hmm. um, as a result of their actions and a result, the result of the Civil Rights Movement which followed their, their exodus, the South was forced to change. And because the South changed, then that meant it was it became uh, a place that was uh, more attractive to all kinds of people, meaning northern wh white Northerners who would never have lived there otherwise, immigrants from other parts of the world who might not have ever considered living in the South, and of course African Americans who have connections there, but who also might not have considered going there as well in the South as it had been before. And so in that respect, African Americans are acting as the as other Americans are, meaning taking advantage of opportunities in a part of the country that um, has um, uh, growth, has um, you know more favorable weather from many people's perspective, and they're acting as Americans. And, and because of the Great Migration and the Civil Rights Movement, they now have the opportunity to to make choices based upon what's best for them and their family, not not having to make a decision solely on the f the basis of well, there's a caste system and there's there's violence attached to it, and I have to flee. So this was an opening up of the country overall, and African Americans, the descendants of Great Migration are able to take advantage of the changes that have occurred since then. Well, as you know, this is NAFSA is a conference of international yeah. educators, and so there are professionals here who are both working with um, students, American students who are going overseas, and welcoming international students to the United States. Um, and I'm an international educator myself, and I find that this moment is a very interesting moment to be working with, with students, particularly African American students because I know the value of study abroad since I did it myself. I know that these students will benefit from expanding their horizons and being perceived as something different than what they're classified here as in the United States. But it's very difficult to convince students to get out of their comfort zone, if you will, and, and, and go somewhere else. 
Um, do you have any advice or, or thoughts on on how what what we can say to students about the value of of, of branching out and getting out there and seeing something new through study abroad? Well, I, I like to view, as you can tell from my comments, that we are more alike than we are different. And I tend to like to, to think of, of all Americans as benefiting from, uh, from expanding one's horizons, all humans actually expanding their horizons and seeing that it's a big world out there. And yet it grows smaller when we get to travel and get to meet people of different backgrounds and we realize how very much we have in common. You know, that people around the world, all of us, you know, care about family, we want to be successful, we want to be happy, everyone wants love and, and acceptance. I mean, you know, human beings have so much more in common and I think that one of the great beauties is that you actually discover that this is, these are universal human uh, experiences and that we, you, you find that you actually have so much more in common, that all these divisions are false constructs, the boundaries and e even nationalities are false construct, constructs that divide us. And I think that by getting a chance to go out and see the world, you get to see that, that human beings in other parts of the world may have different ways of doing the very things that we may be interested in wanting to do. They have different, different traditions that are all leading toward the same goal of you know, happiness, love, freedom, um, agency. And, and I think that there's a lot to learn from that. You know, just the ways that people uh, express themselves, the ways that people celebrate great events in one's life. You know, you learn that when you experience travel and you experience what it's like to live in another country. And you also learn that no one has all the answers, you know, that you can learn something from wherever you go. Mm -hmm. And I just think learning is not just about books, it's not just about, you know, um, you know dates and battles and, and uh, what you can learn uh, on a, you know, from actual, you know, fact, but just from the experience of being with other people. Mm. Wonderful. Thank you so much for talking with me this afternoon. Well, thank you. It was you. a pleasure. I enjoyed it.